Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. And also thank you for allowing me to talk about the Menshevik Louis bodies, which I think is a little bit of a Cinderella among the sort of atypical dementias. Now, I'm a clinician, so this is going to be a totally different talk. I'm going to talk really from the clinician perspective. So these are my disclosures. So how good are we at diagnosing dementia with Lewy bodies? I think overall not so good, unfortunately. And this slide, which comes from Ian McKeith, I think beautifully illustrates our problem. So when we have patients which have all the typical features of dementia with Lewy bodies, we are pretty good at making the clinical diagnosis. However, if we have a more atypical sort of clinical picture, we really struggle. And the problem is that a lot of the pathology of these cases is mixed. So a lot of patients who have Lewy body pathology have also Alzheimer pathology. And the Alzheimer pathology somehow obscures the typical features. So we tend to unfortunately miss these cases and really struggle with our, to identify them without any biomarkers. Now when we come to prodromal DLB, we really haven't even started compared to Alzheimer's disease where there has been loads of research done and we have even clinical criteria. We at present haven't really even discussed it properly and there are definitely no criteria. Now, if you look at the epidemiology of dementia with Lewy bodies, if you look at autopsies, you can see that in unselected dementia autopsies, 15 to 30 percent of the cases will have Lewy body pathology. And that would really indicate to us that dementia with Lewy body is most probably the second most common degenerative dementia in the patients over the age of 65. Now, if you look at clinical studies, if you look at the community prevalence, it's been shown to be only around 4%. It's a little bit better when you look at secondary care, so that patients that present to clinicians, it's about 7.5% from you know, looking at the different studies. Now, if you compare how many cases we identified clinically to the number of cases that we identified post-mortem, it would appear that we miss about, you know, up to 50% of cases. Now, this might be a little bit exaggerated because autopsy cases are sometimes, you know, there's a selection bias, they're more difficult to diagnose, and maybe some of the cases did have Lewy body pathology but it was not severe enough to be the main reason for the dementia. But there is clearly a gap between what we see at autopsy and what we diagnose during patient's life. So in, to improve our diagnostic ability, we have tried to come up with clinical criteria. And there were a few sort of criteria before the 96, because it was only an emerging disease. But in 1996, they were the first sort of international consensus criteria. Unfortunately, after they been sort of, people tried to evaluate them, they showed that although they had very good specificity, they had very low sensitivity. So, New criteria were published in 2005 and with the hope that this will improve our clinical ability to diagnose patients during life. So this is a meta-analysis of the performance of the criteria. I highlighted in red the sort of aggregated studies. So you can see originally the 1996 criteria had very poor sensitivity, but they had fairly good 
specificity. So when the new criteria came in, we got very excited because the sensitivity has really gone up. And you can see it really has moved from just over 50% to 86%. However, what happened unfortunately, the specificity has dropped. So from very good specificity, over 80, it has gone down to 74. So as you can see, neither criteria were really ideal. We were still clearly missing a lot of cases. So in 2015, there was another big conference in Florida, and we came up with new diagnostic criteria, which have been published this year in June, I think, or July. And I'm going to now talk more in detail about these new criteria. So the new criteria continue to be the same as the previous one in the way that they still have the essential features. They have their core clinical features. However, they have now four core clinical features compared to previously only three. And they don't have any more suggestive features. The suggestive features were abolished and the features from there were distributed either to the core features or to just supportive clinical features. However, what we have new, we now have indicative biomarkers. And this really reflects the progress in the last 10 years that we have made in identifying different biomarkers for DLB. So starting with the essential feature, which hasn't changed, so patients, in order to make the diagnosis, patients have to have dementia. So they have to have a clear cognitive impairment, which interferes with everyday functioning. Now, compared to Alzheimer's disease, which is the main differential diagnosis, memory does not have to be a prominent feature. What people but patients tend to have more in the very early stages, they have more attentional problems, executive dysfunction, and visual perceptual difficulties. And then we have our four. So in addition to that, they have to have some core features. So the first core features from the previous criteria has, has stayed and changed, so still fluctuating cognition is a core feature and what we're looking for for patients to have marked fluctuations from day to day, even from hour to hour. The second one, again, unchanged, is recurrent vivid visual hallucination. So this is unchanged, continues to be a core feature, and patients described these vivid visual hallucinations, they typically see people, animals, and they can find them quite distressing. On the occasion, they find them quite pleasant. I have a patient who sees a little orchestra in his garden, and he's quite happy about that. The third one, again, spontaneous Parkinsonism, is the same as in the previous criteria. And I have to stress, it's spontaneous Parkinsonism, so it's not drug-induced. However, what we now recognize, that although this is Carizon being a core feature, that it doesn't have to be so pronounced, that you really have to look for the bradykinesia rigidity, that it can be much more symmetrical than in Parkinson's disease, and definitely less pronounced. And we have now a new core feature, which is REM sleep behavior disorder. And you already heard about it, that this is very typical for any, any, any patients who have alpha synucleopathy. So it's not totally specific to DLB. However, it's extremely rare in patients with Alzheimer's disease. And because Alzheimer's disease is a main differential diagnosis, if a patient have REM sleep behavior disorder from the description from their spouse, this really immediately points you towards the diagnosis of DLB. Now you do need a 
sort of bed partner to be able to describe to you what's happening and what they typically describe that the patient at night is acting out their dreams. So there's no atonia during the REM sleep and they're shouting, thrashing around. And later on I will show you a video. And they can injure themselves, but they can injure their partner. So we always tell the partner they need to move to another bedroom. So these are the core features. So we have now four of them, but we also now have supportive clinical features. Now, supportive clinical features, they don't have any diagnostic weight because they are a little bit too sort of non-specific. However, if the patient has more, you no know, few of these, that immediately should raise the clinician's sort of, in a way, alertness that could this be dementia with Lewy body, so that they particularly look for the other features. So starting with neuroleptic sensitivity. So this used to be a suggestive feature. So it has been downgraded to just a supportive feature. And what happens if you give a patient with dementia with Lewy bodies a neuroleptic medication, they can have a really dramatic reaction. They can become extremely rigid, but they can also have altered levels of consciousness. And sometimes paradoxically, we because people tend to give it for a psychosis, they become more psychotic, they start to hallucinate more. And we have shown that if you give patients neuroleptics with dementia with Lewy bodies, they have poorer survival. So actually you accelerate their death. So it's something which is contraindicated in patients with dementia with Lewy bodies. So this is the first supportive feature, and we have a further Features we have for postural instability, falls, near falls. We have syncope or other transient episode of unresponsiveness. For instance, the relative would describe that the patient is just staring. They're not unconscious. They're just sitting there and staring and not responding to them. Severe autonomic dysfunction, including, as we heard about, constipation, autostatic hypotension, urinary incontinence. Again, should alert you that this is perhaps not Alzheimer's disease, but could be dementia with Lewy bodies. Hypersomnia, which means that people have more than two or three hours during the day where they just nod off and they sleep during the day, but they still sleep at night. Loss of smell, it's another feature. Apathy, anxiety, and depression. I have to say, particularly anxiety and depression can be present well before the cognitive features start. And sometimes patients present first with anxiety or depression to psychiatrists and they don't respond to treatment and then three years later they develop dementia with Lewy bodies. Hallucinations in other modalities. So sometimes these visions, they also can talk, but they, so they can be hallucinations of auditory hallucinations and sometimes pa patients have secondary systematized delusions usually to explain the hallucinations. So these are all the clinical features and then we have a totally new category so we have indicative biomarkers. So to start we have three indicative biomarkers so the first one is reduced dopamine transporter uptake in the striatum, which can be demonstrated either by SPECT or PET, abnormal MIBG cardiac scintigraphy, and the third one is confirmation in a sleep lab of REM sleep behavior disorder. So I will show you a little bit about each of them. So the first one is reduced dopamine transporter uptake. And he, you can just see there are two machines. One is a PET and one is a SPECT. So you can look at it, whatever it's available. SPECT is more available. And if you look here, so this is a normal dopamine transporter scan. And you can see a nice uptake in a chordate and in a putamen. And it's symmetrical both sides. So this is what you see in a normal person or in a patient with Alzheimer's disease. It's particularly helpful when you have a differential diagnosis with Alzheimer's disease in a patient with dementia. 
because patients with Alzheimer's disease don't have any dopaminergic deficit. Now, if you look at the bottom picture, so this is an abnormal scan. You can rate it visually, and you could see there is still some uptake in a chordate, but it's not as strong, and you really can't anymore visualize the chordate. Now, this is important because in the early stages, the extrapyramidal symptoms are not particularly common. They are maybe in 25-30% of cases. But if you perform the scan, the scan is more sensitive, then the, it can pick up already the dopaminergic deficit before the clinical features of the extrapyramidal symptoms. And the reason is that it will pick up reduction, which starts around 20%, so much earlier than the 50% when you start get, getting clinical symptoms. So the next one is abnormal cardiac scintigraphy. And the reason is that patients with dementia with Lewy bodies, they have cardiac sympathetic denervation. And we can visualize this. Again, we can rate these scans visually, although we can also do a quantitative analysis. And what we look, we look at the ratio between the mediastinum, we look at the uptake in the mediastinum and the heart. So we look at the ratio between the heart and the mediastinum. And so you see this is a patient with dementia with Lewy bodies. And you can see here, you really don't have any uptake in the heart. This is a patient with Alzheimer's disease. You can see normal uptake. You can see the heart. And this is again is a normal volunteer, you can see the heart, and if you co compare it to the mediastinum, you should get a ratio above two, and you can see it's below two here. So this is clearly a deficit. And this has shown to be a very good method, and certainly with very good sensitivity and specificity. We don't have any autopsy studies yet, but it's definitely a promising method, and it's used particularly in Japan, it's very popular to use it as a biomarker when we are trying to diagnose patients with dementia with Lewy bodies. So the first supportive biomarker is medial temporal lobe atrophy, preservation of medial temporal lobes. And as you can see, in a patient with Alzheimer's disease, we have severe medial temporal atrophy, the hippocampal atrophy. And you can see that on this picture. Now, compared to patients with dementia with Lewy bodies, where in about 60% of cases we have preservation of the medial temporal lobes. Now, it's only in about 60% because a lot of the cases have mixed pathology, and if they have mixed pathology, they will also have atrophy. But if, it's, if there is no atrophy, that can be quite helpful. The next one is if we perform a metabolic scan, we can, we can show that patients with dementia with Lewy bodies, sorry, I think what, I held it too long, now it will have to be restored. I think I just turned it off. But I'm told when you do this that somebody will be at the back and very helpfully turn it on again. Maybe not. Maybe they, can they turn it on? I think I turned it off. Lovely. Thank you. So, if you look at the top scan, so this is a metabolic scan. This is a normal control, nice metabolism everywhere. If you look at a patient with Alzheimer's disease, there is a clear hypometabolism in the temporal parietal lobes. But there is one area where in Parkinson's disease the metabolism is well preserved, and that's in the occipital lobes. Now, if you look at a patient with dementia with Lewy bodies, they have a very similar hypometabolism, like the patient with Alzheimer's disease, temporal parietal, but in addition, they also have occipital hypometabolism. So if as part of your workup of a patient with dementia with Lewy bodies, you also do a metabolic scan, then if you see occipital hypometabolism, that can be very helpful.
Now, these numbers, I have to say, they're not accurate. I noticed a mistake. It should be seven, around 70 percent. This is from very late and rather small studies. And patients also have what's called a posterior cingulate island sign, which means that they have a preservation of metabolism in a posterior cingulate. And you can see that. So if you look for that, that's again would indicate to you that this could be a patient with dementia with Lewy bodies. Now, I'm not going to talk at all about EEG because we're going to have a whole talk about that. So that's another supportive biomarker. So, what are, so how do you make your diagnosis? So in order to be able to make a diagnosis of a probable DLB, the patient has to have two or more core clinical features of DLB. Or they can have just one clinical feature, but then they have to have at least one indicative biomarker. Now, I need to stress if they have just two, indica two or more indicative biomarkers, but no clinical features, it cannot be probable DLB. Now, to make a diagnosis of possible DLB, that's much less strict. You, it's enough to have one core feature, one core clinical feature, or one indicative biomarker. And just before I finish, I thought I'd just show you uh, one slide of amyloid imaging because we're all excited about amyloid imaging and clearly we have performed some amyloid imaging in patients with dementia with Lewy bodies, patients with Parkinson disease, dementia and Parkinson disease. Now, unfortunately, amyloid imaging is of no help when it comes to distinguishing patients between dementia with Lewy bodies and patients with Alzheimer's disease because patients with dementia with Lewy bodies, up to 60% of the cases also have a positive, positive amyloid scan. And the last one, looking at tau, again, although it's very exciting and interesting to see that number of patients with dementia with Lewy bodies do have positive tau scans, Unfortunately, again, it does not help you for differential diagnosis. However, both the amylo and tau generally is helpful in, if you are fairly confident that this is dementia with Lewy bodies. It indicates that there is an additional pathology, and it's increasingly emerging that patients who have both pathology, that they have actually more rapid decline and shorter survival. So that's clearly important to know. And, and if once we have specific treatments, it will be important then to decide which of the pathologies is more driving the clinical syndrome, and perhaps that will then influence what treatment we will choose. So in conclusion, and I can see I've just run out of time, so dementia with Lewy bodies is a fairly common type of dementia but at present it is frequently undiagnosed. There has definitely been a progress in de developing imaging and other biomarkers, and the diagnostic criteria continue to evolve. However, it remains to be seen how the new criteria will perform against autopsies, and we will only see, know the answers, I suspect, in the next at least three or five years. Thank you. Thank you.